Hi everybody, today we're going to talk about modeling with linear functions and previously we've talked about modeling with linear equations and there's a big difference between those two things. When we model with linear equations we're really looking for a specific solution. When we look at linear functions though we expect there to be a lot of solutions so for every input we get an output so that makes it a lot different. So let's just review really quickly what a linear function is. A linear function can be written in the form f of x equals mx plus b. So m here is going to represent how the function is changing. So it could be positive, it could be negative. b is going to be like the initial value of the function, and b really changes based on the application. So b might represent a fixed cost, it could be a minimal charge or a price, it could be a starting elevation. There are a lot of different things that b could represent. The best way to really check this out is to do some examples. So we're going to start with something we're probably all familiar with, which is buying gas. And let's say that the price of gas is $4.89 per gallon. We're going to construct a function c of x that models buying x gallons. So I'm going to say c of x is equal to, it's 4.89x, and then plus nothing. So sometimes that b could be the starting price is we're at zero, right? We haven't bought anything yet, so we don't have to write the plus zero there. And the 4.89 shows how our cost is going to change for every whole unit of x. The next part we are going to find and interpret c of 12. So c of 12 will be 4.89 times 12, which is 58.68. The interpretation is 12 gallons of gas will cost $50.68. Another type of linear function, we could look at linear depreciation. So let's say a car valued at $42,500 is believed to depreciate at $6,000 per year. We're going to write a function v of t for the value of the car t years after it was purchased. So we're going to start with v of t. Now when we're thinking like our f of x, equals mx plus b, we kind of look at how much does it change and where did it start. So I'm going to actually write the start first, which was 42,500. We have this value of where the car started. The depreciate infers that the value is going down, so I want to write a negative with the 6,000 and then times t to show that every year we're going to lose this amount of money. Now we're going to find the value of the car three years after it was purchased, so v of 3 is 42,500 minus 6,000 times 3, which is 24,500. Let's be clear that depreciation is not always linear, so this is a specific type of depreciation. It is not all depreciation. You'll see a lot of depreciation is exponential, um, and we'll talk about that later, but for this example, I wanted to use a linear depreciation to show you how we could take a linear function and apply it to cars. So let's look at population. The population of a small town is 5,800 in 2018. In 2021, the population grew to 10,600. So assuming the population experienced linear growth, let's find the average population growth per year. So what do we want to do? We want to look at how did the population change. So 10,600 minus 5,800 shows me how much it changed. And then I want to divide by over what period of time, so 2021 minus 2018. So I hope you see here that this is slope. 10,600 minus 5,800 gives me 4,800, and that was over three years. So that says our change, and I'm gonna write that as M, is 1,600, so we're seeing 1,600 more people per year. Now we're gonna find the function P of T that models the population T years after 2018. So P of T is gonna be our slope, 1,600, times t to show that's each year, plus we want to look at where did we start? We started at 5,800. Part C says find the population of the town in 2025. Most important thing to do here is to look at the time. So the time, 2025, I need to subtract 2018 to see this is seven years after our model began. So when we find p of 7, which is 1,600 times 7 plus 5,800, we can see that the population is now 17,000. The next problem says the water level at the Hoover Dam has fallen from 1,199 feet in the year 2000 to 1,041 feet in the year 2022. So we're going to start by finding the average decrease in water level per year. So very similar to the last problem, we are finding the slope. And so what we're going to do here is we look at where did we end up? So we end up at 1,041. Where did we start? 
1199. And what years went by? 2022 minus 2000. So this time we're seeing a decrease. The water level has dropped 158 feet over 22 years. I'm just going to leave that as a fraction because I don't want to estimate it. So I'm going to reduce that to negative 79 over 11. When I have fractions like that, I only like to change them into a decimal if it comes out to a finite number of decimal places, and this one does not. Part B says write a linear function for the water level, WT, T years after 2000. So I'm going to write WT is negative 79 times 11 times T plus, what did it start at? 1199. So this B represents where was my water level in the year 2000, and then the slope, negative 79 over 11, tells me how the water level is changing. So as a consequence of this change, we have this future problem that the water level must be at or above 1,000 feet for the hydropower turbines to operate. If the lake continues to decrease at the current rate, when will the turbines be inoperable? So we are going to take 1,000 and set it equal to negative 79 over 11 times t plus 1,199. I'm going to move this 1,199 over to the left, which means I'm subtracting. I get negative 199 is equal to negative 79 over 11 t. And then I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal. So I'm just going to flip the negative 79 over 11. I'm going to make it 11 over negative 79. And I do that on both sides. And at this point, I am going to go ahead and let the calculator round for me. So when I did negative 199 times 11 over negative 79, I got 27.7. And that's going to be t. Now, we are not done. Because 27.7 represents years, and it's years after the year 2000. So when you get something like this where it's a 0.7 and you're thinking about if you're going to round it, I kind of want to round it down because if I round it up, it's already surpassed that 1,000 feet that I we're saying it can't get to. So I'm going to round this down to 27. I'm being overly conservative here and say we're going to take the year 2000, we're going to add 27, and sometime in the year 2027, we expect the water level to get below 1,000 feet, which means we have to turn the pumps off. So it's important to kind of think about your round rounding here. When you're doing the homework, of course, if you try it and you get it wrong, you can try it again, but I want you to think through what makes sense for the rounding. Rounding should not always be traditional. All right, next one, I want to do a comparison of two stocks. So stock A, we're saying we buy one share of stock and we look at the value of it and how it's changing. So I am being ultra nice and saying this stock is changing really quickly. So two months after we had it, stock A is worth $25. After four months, it's at $48. At six months, it's $71. And after eight months, it's up to $94. So we have this great change. Stock B, a little bit harder to see, but I want you to kind of follow through. I have this graph that shows when we purchased it, it was $15, and eight months later, it's up to $90. So hopefully you can see those numbers across my graph. We're going to break this into three parts. The first part says, let's write an equation for the value of stock A X months after it was purchased. So if we're trying to write this equation for A, and I'm just going to call it A of X to show it's the value of A X months later, I need to know MX plus B. So M says, how is it changing? So to get the change, let's just take two months. So I'm going to say m is equal to 48 minus 25 over 4 minus 2. So this is 23 over 2, which is 11.5. I don't have a zero here. I didn't give you where the stock started. I only gave you what's happening months down the road. So when I'm looking at this a of x, and I know right now it's 11.5x plus b, I still need to solve for the b. One way we could do that is just take a condition we already know. We know that a of 2 is 25. So that means 25 is equal to 2 times 11.5 plus b. That says 25 is equal to 23 plus b, so b must be 2. So let's kind of square this off so you can see it. a of x is 11.5x plus two. So we paid two dollars for this stock and it's changing at a rate of eleven and a half dollars a month. Awesome.
In B, I can see things a little bit better. I can see where it touches the y-axis, so that says my y-intercept B is equal to 15. Then when I'm trying to figure out how is it changing, well, I can use the beginning and end of this line. So I can see at the end, the y value is 90. It started at 15. The y value of 90 corresponds to an x value of 8, where the 15 corresponds to 0. 90 minus 15 is 75, and we're going to divide that by 8, which says this is 9.375. So let's say we call this b of x, to say stock b. It's 9.375 times x plus 15. So I can see how is it changing and where did it start. At the end, the question is, which stock has a greater rate of change? And that would be A. A is changing at $11.5 a month versus B is changing at 9.375. But look at what we had to do to get there. So we really do want to evaluate it and not just eyeball it to decide what the answer is. So our last one, I thought we'd have a little fun and say, what if we won the lottery? And this lottery is just, we bought a scratch off ticket and after taxes, we got $34,500 and we decided that we're just going to keep our money in our safe at home and we're not going to put it in the bank. Then we are going to allow ourselves to spend $250 per week. I want to know how long will it take for us to deplete our winnings. So if we look at it, this $34,500, that's our B. But we're spending, so that's a negative value, $250 per week, so let's call that X. So why don't we say this is m of x, the money we have after x weeks. Well, we want to know when is that zero? So we're going to set 34,500 minus 250x equal to zero, which says 34,500 equals 250x, so divide by 250. When we divide, we found out that that's 138 is our x. So what does that say to us? 138 weeks, that sounds like a long time, but it's just over two and a half years. Actually, if you divide 138 by 52, you would say the money's not going to last very long. But at least it was fun while we had it. So I hope this helps you see different places we could apply linear functions to help us figure out values.